Good evening. Welcome to the University of Washington, um, Kane Hall, one of our larger lecture halls on campus. They're not all this big, the rooms. I'm David Domke, I'm a professor and the acting chair in the Department of Communication at the University of Washington, who, which is one of the sponsors for this evening's event. Another one is the Online News Association. And so we're working with them um, to put on this event and partly because uh, both of us come at this from different professional perspectives, um, but with a deep commitment to the role of journalism in society, in democracy, and with an attempt to, and a desire to figure out where we're gonna be and where we might be going in terms of journalism in this country. It's a great privilege of mine. I worked as a professional journalist for several newspapers back in the 1980s and 1990s. And then whenever, when I left the profession, all of my colleagues thought I had died and was going off to academia, which to them was a terrible thing. And now over the last 10 years, many of them have contacted me and said, you know, I, I might like to teach. You, you got anything over there? You got any possibilities? Um, and so I never thought I'd be a visionary, but on this one, and getting off a sinking ship at some level, I was, I was fortunately a little bit ahead of the curve. But I get the great privilege now of spending a lot of my days and a lot of my time thinking about where journalism might be going and about what we might be able to do. I'm not gonna play much of a role this evening. I'm just here to kind of uh, say hello and welcome you here. But I did wanna just throw out three pieces that might be useful for us as backdrops for the evening. A colleague of mine, Lance Bennett, has spent a lot of time doing work on kind of thinking about citizenship in the United States, about ways in which citizenship, the way we think about citizenship, changes over time. And Lance and I have had an ongoing conversation, and I want to suggest to you that there's the backdrop for everything that we're here to talk about tonight is a citizenship revolution, a way that we think about citizenship, what it means to be a citizen. And so there might be two ways that we might think about it that I'd like to suggest that Lance has offered and I've kind of worked with him or uh, back and forth. One is a, a, what he has called a dutiful model for thinking about a citizen, for being a citizen, by which in a nutshell is the idea that there are obligations and responsibilities that we have when it comes to being a citizen. And those might include taking a morning newspaper, those might include voting, those might include joining organizations, but there's a sense of obligation, a dutiful component to it. The model that Lance is arguing, and I agree with him in many respects, that we've now moved into is a networked model of citizenship, where people don't function as citizens out of a sense of obligation, but they function in, in being a citizen out of a sense of relationship, a sense of relationship of who's, who do they care about that's engaged in some topic or some issue of the day, who might empower them and engage them in certain ways. These are quite important distinctions. There much more could be said about them, but I'll just leave it out there and make the note that people that are dutiful citizens, ones who by and large see the world through this model, really don't like networked citizens because they feel that they are leaving behind, they are abrogating the sense of responsibility that the dutiful citizen has lived with. The network citizen isn't really troubled by that. They say, you know what, that's okay, you have your take on it, I have my take, I'll network all around that, that's just fine. But these are quite different models of citizenship. We might think about them not in any kind of political ideological sensibility, but in a more kind of generational sensibility in this capacity. That John McCain represents the dutiful citizen. He joined the military, served his country out of a sense of obligation and responsibility, has done many things very good for our society. And Barack Obama is the network citizen that he's chosen certain pathways that he can't give up his Blackberry, that he functions out of a set of networks and relationships, that this is the way he understands the world. And so I think that there was much more than ideology at stake in the last election. There was also a sense of kind of what it means to be a citizen. One other thing I want to offer to us is I want to show us a bit of how these citizenship models might be tied to different media usages. It isn't just that people suddenly woke up one day and decided not to use newspapers or to read newspapers. There's, there's part of something deeper here. So let's just take a little bit of Pew Research Center data. This is nonpartisan data. And they asked in the midst of the presidential election, what were the campaign news sources that were most used by people? They could name up to two. And let's break this down by age. So across the bottom, 
we've got 65, and then the other one's blocked out, and it's 50 to 64, and then 30 to 49-year-olds, and 18 to 29-year-olds. And let's take what they said were the top two sources. For 65 and over, top two sources are television and newspapers. A little bit of internet at usage. That's our 65 and older random sampling to the public. 50 to 64-year-olds, television's still up there. Newspapers are now starting to compete a bit with the internet. As you move across, you begin to see a distinct trend in which television remains a primary source of information and engagement with campaigns, but that the internet, as you move across to a younger population, begins to first challenge and then supersede substantially hard copy newspapers. This is an unsustainable model for any business, generationally. And hard copy newspapers are fighting this losing battle right now. If they can transition to that online environment, maybe, maybe that could be a way to think about sustaining. But this is indicative of this kind of media shift that's accompanying some of this networked citizenship. And I'll finish with this. There is this sense that maybe all this is leading more and more to an apathetic citizenry, that they're not that engaged, that they don't care. So let's ask this simple question as the Pew Research Center says, have you given a lot of thought to elections? Pew has asked this question over the last four presidential elections, 96, 2000, 2004, and 2008. And the breakdown that I've put there is what the answers were in 1996, the breakdown you might expect among the general population across age groups. Older people giving a lot more thought, younger people not giving much thought as of the 1996 presidential election. But let me extend this out over the last three presidential elections, and let's see where the citizenry went in terms of their thinking and concern about these elections. We have a 20% movement upwards in 50 to 64-year-olds. A 20% movement upwards in terms of interest among 65 and plus olders a 30-plus movement upwards of 30 to 49-year-olds, and a 35% increase in the interest of these elections, across, interest in the election across these elections among 18 to 29-year-olds. This is the first time, if you look across kind of public interest in presidential elections, the first time in which across age groups you begin to get a convergence. I think this is indicative of these media shifts, of these citizenship shifts, and as someone who teaches younger people <laughs> It speaks to me that they're looking for ways to engage, not for ways to check out. Given new networked opportunities, they find them. This is all encouraging to me. I get to work in the business of hope. That's what being an educator is all about, the industry of hope. But now we get to turn to the industry of real. <laughs> I'm going to hand it off to Hanson Hossein. He's going to lead this panel. Hanson is my colleague in the D Department of Communication. He's the director of an innovative, forward-looking program that we have, a master's in digital media. Hanson has been a tremendous colleague. He's been with us for the past two years. Take it away, Hanson. Thanks, David. Thank you, David, for that excellent start to this conversation. Um, you know what? I hope that you'll stick around long enough, because I'm sure that these folks will have some questions for you as we get into the panel. I'm really amazed by the turnout. Uh, when Tom Brew from, the, from MSNBC and the Online News Association, Tom, where are you, by the way? Oh, Tom here. He approached me a couple months ago and said, you know, we really need to, to talk about new models of journalism and maybe we could partner up on something. And so he thought, yeah, we'll get 20 or 30 hard scrabble old timer journalists to get together. We'll chat in the room and then go have a beer at big time. Well, we're going to still go have a beer at big time, but I don't know if they're waiting for all these people to join us. But thank you all for coming. And just out of curiosity, since we are from the communications department, um, we want to, always want to figure out how you reached our, how you received our communication. So how many of you heard about this event on the radio? Not bad. We've been advertising on KEXP and KUOW. How many people heard about it uh, through Twitter? OK, not bad, too. OK. Um, what else did I have? Facebook. Um, carrier pigeon, no, joking. <laughs> what, I, 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 is it mostly word of mouth, then? Email, okay, great. And I know a lot of you came from far away for this, so I'm really pleased that you are here. So thank you all for joining us. And um, I, uh, I've run a number of, of events in the last few months just to try to get word out about communication and media in transition. And one thing that I truly despise is the panel format. Um, 
I just find it very difficult. I find it very blocky. It's very much a top-down thing. So you'll see there's no table here. It's, very, it's meant to be a conversation. And I'm sure there's a good number of you, and I, I've identified a few faces in this crowd, who are probably wondering, why am I not on that panel? And maybe some of you are saying, why aren't I moderating it? Um, but I, what, what I really like to have here tonight is a, a real conversation. So um, please don't see these people or myself as experts on this. Um, nobody's figured this out yet. Um, I, I handpicked these folks because I believe they present models and a way forward. But we're still trying to figure it out. And I think the answers may reside in the conversation and discussion. So the way we're going to do this is that I'm going to direct a few uh, specific questions at each person, but throughout, uh, rather than waiting for the last 20 minutes to have the real uh, hard knuckle conversation, I want to keep it open. So I'll be looking to you and just put your hand up. We'll have a microphone over there. If you're over there and you don't want to get all the way to the mic, just yell the question I'll repeat it. We are recording this tonight and we'll be putting it up online on UW uh, websites and I believe the Online News Association, so it'll be there for posterity. If you don't want to be on camera, Hide your face or let, let us know, and we'll try to figure out how to do that. So this is one of many events that's been happening in Seattle for, over the last couple of weeks because of what's happening with the PI. And some of you may have heard just yesterday the uh, San Francisco Chronicle uh, is uh, in danger, uh, Hearst, another Hearst-owned property. I, I, I feel there's been a lot of conversation about the future of newspapers, and I think we need to get beyond that. Uh, there's no secret that Craigslist and Google have been attacking the, new, the, the newspaper model, and uh, I think that's fairly well accepted. Uh, I personally believe that traditional media has been in decline for many years, even before the internet. I worked at NBC News uh, for a number of years, and we were constantly keeping our eyes on the ratings, and I worked with Tom Brokaw, saw those ratings going downhill even before there were other sources. So we were already looking at the fragmentation of media and, and journalism before the internet, and yes, we could look to the internet and this current economic uh, conditions as, as precipitating um, the decline in journalism as we know it, but it ha had already been breaking up, and I think it's something that we need to acknowledge and not sort of wring our hands and say, what was me? This is all happening in the last six months. It's been a, it's been a very long process. And this really comes, I mean, for me, this personally, uh, having worked in television news and being a traditional journalist, um, I used to go to war zones in the late 90s and, and, and see younger people showing up with small cameras shooting stories that I wish I was st shooting, uh, rather than doing sort of these big monolithic policy stories for NBC. And that's what got me thinking that I wanted to get out of my traditional journalism and start using this technology to tell my own stories and use social platforms to motivate people with different messages. And that's why I got out when I got out. And it's something that I've kept my eye on uh, incessantly over the last 10 years. And it's, it's something that we explore at the Master of Communication and Digital Media as well, is these new forms of storytelling and probably more important these new models and that's what I really want to talk about tonight is what can be those new models there's no doubt based on David's or David's presentation that journalism in some way must survive it's vital to our society and our democracy the question is how can we do it to, how can we ensure that it survives sustainably so with that in mind I'd like to introduce the panel and I'm going to do it in a non reading from a bio way. I mean, I, I chose these people because I believe that they really offer something, and so I know of them already. And I'll start with Corey Haig here from the seattletimes.com. Um, I first met Corey when I just started at the University of Washington. It was a meeting with the top folks at the, at the Seattle Times with uh, the previous chair of the Department of Communication. And I instantly felt that Corey got it. You know, she was working within a traditional news organization, but here's a woman who worked at the Times Picayune in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, and she was already doing some amazing online work there. And here she is doing uh, uh, equally important t uh, work in a time when her institution and her company are, are in question. So I felt like it was very important that Corey be part of this conversation. And she's also a board member of the Online News Association. So to me, Corey as a model represents the transition of traditional media to online media. Um, Monica Guzman here. Uh, I've been wanting to meet Monica for months. I follow her on Twitter. She's probably one of the most vital young voices out in this region today. Uh, she's the journalist I wish I could have been. And so, uh, I tried tweeting Monica directly to see if she wanted to meet so we could talk about collaboration. And I always got the sense she was too busy, nor did she know who I was. So 
in many ways, we created this, organ this event just so we could have, I could meet Monica, <laughs> so. But Monica was hired by the PI to be their, your fir their first online journalist, from what I understand. And um, she's been really uh, an influential voice uh, uh, through her blogs on the PI and through her Twitter. Uh, who are you on Twitter? You're Monica Guzman, aren't you? Moni Guzman, who's probably, if anybody's you know, serious about living in Seattle, she's a great person to follow if you use Twitter. So I'm really pleased that she could join us because in many ways she represents the model of the, of the individual journalist with a, a singular voice who may be able to survive the, the current, current onslaught, and that's what I hope to ask her about. Corey Bergman I encountered uh, online uh, five years ago when I was in Baghdad embedded with the first cavalry still working for NBC News. Uh, I was despondent and, and depressed about still working in television news and being in Baghdad. And one of my friends who was working there said, you should check out lostremote.com. Corey, who runs that, is really looking at the future of media and the future of television news. And I started looking at that, and it totally inspired me. And, and, that, and during that period, I decided then and there that I was never going to work for television news again. So I returned to North America, and I started making my own documentaries using many of the models and ideas that, that Corey put forward on LostRemote.com. He also helped pioneer some great online journalism for King 5, and now he's in, in charge of business development at MSNBC. Um, but to me, what Corey's most important work is what he's doing uh, in hyper-local blogs. He, he runs MyBallard.com, which is a terrific local news blog for the community of Ballard here in Seattle. And I believe he's overseeing a number of other hyper-local blogs throughout the city. So I wanted to have Corey to talk about these new local media models. Ross Reynolds also encountered a few years ago. I was on his show, The Conversation, on KUOW in 2005 when I just finished shooting this documentary with my wife and I was his guest. Then a couple years later, I, we ran, I ran into Ross because he wanted to possibly come into the Master of Communication and Digital Media, our program, because he was really interested in exploring the future of public radio, especially at a local level, given the, the, the massive challenges faced by digital media. So not only is Ross a well-known personality here in the Puget Sound area as the host of the conversation, he's a student in our program, and he's trying to figure these things out, and he's using the classes in our program to do research. And I believe he's heading to Oxford this summer to maybe get some more ideas about what to do with public radio. So Ross represents the public funding model Many people have actually talked about maybe we should all take the NPR PBS model and make it a nonprofit journalism world. Lastly, John Cook, who um, probably the, the the man who likes to take most risks. I think I met John last week when he featured me on Tech Flash. I, I remember reading about John last year when he made this precipitous jump away from his job, his staff job at the Seattle uh, Post Intelligencer, to join um, the. Uh, Puget Sound Business Journal, and to build this wonderful institution, techflash.com, which is the go-to blog for Seattle technology sector. In fact, I was um, at somebody's office. He's the chair of the Washington State Technology Association today, and he was firing up his computer, and Tech Flash was his home page. So clearly, John is building something really amazing uh, with a, a niche, and I think that's the model that John presents to us today, that you can do vital journalism if you identify your audience and can serve them with really important, relevant information. So that's how I've kind of isolated you as superheroes here. I may have mischaracterized you, so I hope you can correct me as you tell your own stories. So what I'd like to do to begin with is just ask each one of them, I have a question for each one of them that I hope will just spur a larger conversation. And please feel free to jump in at any time. You all have something to add to this, and uh, I really want to engage you as soon as possible. So. Um, I think I'll start with Corey Bergman, because um, the big question is, you know, there's no shortage of people who want to consume journalism. Uh, in fact, they say that there's more, there's more demand for journalism and news than ever before. The problem is, is nobody really wants to pay for it. They're kind of used to not paying for it. So, Corey, from what you've seen, what will pay for journalism, or how should we pay for journalism? You start with such an easy question. Yeah, sorry. I figured you could handle it. <laughs> Um, you know, that's a great question. I mean, my fascination has been, uh, I mean, I've worked in journalism my entire life and recently moved to business development because I felt that the problem that needed to be solved was business more than it was the, the content side of the equation. There were plenty of people that were really trying to figure out the content side. Um, you know, what we've seen is really moving from, you know, from a newspaper perspective, you've seen organizations that were mono monopolies or semi-monopolies who were able to set their own ad rates and were able to adjust their own ad inventory uh, to a highly competitive environment online 
where there is really no scarcity of ad inventory. There's you know competitors that span. ESPN now is a competitor for every local newspaper in America. And you know how do you sort of move into that area? And uh, as ad rates begin to fall, and as commoditization of what we're seeing of some display advertising today, how do you how do you uh, monetize that? I don't have any good good answers to that. I do think that uh, my inclination is that micropayments probably would not work on a large scale. Um, you know, I think that you know some of the things that that news organizations need to do is really to figure out what's sort of the, a new model of connecting an audience to businesses. Because if you look and see, you know, if you if you're looking for information about a, to you want to buy a product or a service, one of the last places you go now is a newspaper or a television website. And that's a problem, because in the old days, you went to the newspaper to find out in classifieds and other ways that how you might, might want to buy something. And if you as a news organization are not in that direct pathway between uh, you know, a user who's looking to buy something and a business who's looking to sell something, and you can't take credit for any part of that decision, then you've really sort of you've excluded yourself from that buying equation, and then you can't derive value from it economically. So what you're left with are sort of these display ads of which you try to convince people sort of indirectly to make a purchase decision. This is especially true on a local level more than a national level because locally people really don't want to build brand. They want to drive people through their front doors and their businesses. So you know, how, can business, how can newspaper sites and television websites better connect people to businesses, um, you know, be it through business directories or through social business directories, uh, I think is a real area to, to go in and when, you know, we'll talk more about from a neighborhood model, it becomes particularly interesting because people tend to know their businesses much better from a neighborhood perspective and they're able to refer other people in the neighborhood to them and the value of that sort of referral process I think is amplified in a neighborhood setting and really opens up some interesting opportunities. Thanks. So that brings up a good point is that it's not, it's, journalism maybe shouldn't take it so personally that things are on the decline. It's not just journalism. Uh, the models that are in question are everything from public relations to advertising. And you know, one of my favorite students pointed this out to me very early and, and I, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks, but we've never paid for the true cost of journalism. The closest thing we ever came to it was paying for a subscription for a newspaper. But as we know, that for, for the, all the 20th century is being subsidized by advertising. And if advertising itself is in question, then how do you pay for it? Don't we already have sort of the suggestion of your selling information? So everyone who wants to know about a movie, what if you're selling to the the sellers of the movie, information about all the people that want to know about their movie. I mean, I don't know. This has a technical name that I don't know. Sure. So, I mean, any, anything that connects, it could go either way, right? Right. So, so maybe the value is the value of aggregating all the people that want to see Prince of or Knight, whatever the Batman movie was. Dark, Dark Knight. Knight. All those people, like, because they want to buy leather. Or, I don't know. But right, so it's you know the, one of the names for that's lead generation, right? Being okay, able to find so, qualified leads. For so how would that product. make? I'd like to hear how would that is that making money for somebody in America already, and how does it make money? A lead generation is a it's a growing business, and uh, absolutely, I mean the ability to be able to narrow down people who are interested in a particular product or service, and then basically selling access to those people back to the business. Uh, we see a lot of that, uh, especially in the auto space right now. It's you know Cars.com, for example, Auto Trader. They're all based on that that exact same model. So let's, um, assuming that we take it out of relying solely on advertising and maybe go to more, you know, paying for journalism, my question for Corey Haig is this, uh, coming from traditional uh, newspapers where people had paid for their subscriptions, what about putting a wall up around online journalism, like the Wall Street Journal? They charge, you, if you want access to the premium stuff, you've got to be a subscriber. Have, have, you, have you at the seattletimes.com contemplated that as your, your analog dollars come down, your digital pennies are going up, but you really can't equate the two to keep the business going? Well, no. <laughs> We're not thinking about that. I mean, we all know what didn't work for the New York Times, Times Select, you know, paying for that content. Um, I, I get it. We all know why they did it. It works for the Wall Street Journal because that kind of premium content has a niche audience as well. The people that read that want to read that. You know, when I 
decide what goes on our homepage. There's a whole you know, meat and potatoes and vegetables and junk food aspect. People, you have to give them what they want, but you we're in the business of informing people for democracy's sake in some way, so you also have to give them what they need. People aren't necessarily going to pay for what they need, right? <laughs> and so, sure, we could charge, and if they really want it, they'll buy it, and then they'll not buy some other things. I, I, I just don't know that um, that model's going to work. So we can wall it up, and then maybe it just stays behind that wall, because the internet works, because why? It's free. And do you think it's just in our culture here in the United States not to pay the true cost of journalism? I mean, do you, my, my thinking is, is that we'll continue to see a decline in the institutions because they can't, nobody wants to pay for it and they lose advertising, and then we'll have less watchdogs. I mean, we're already talking about less journalists in Washington, D.C. at a time when we need them the most. And some terrible thing will happen because we weren't able to really keep an eye on what was going on among powerful institutions. And maybe we, as the American public, will come to our senses and say, oh, you know what, we need to pay for journalism. Do you think that will ever happen, or people are just too used to getting it for free? Possibly. I mean, they still could possibly get it for free if it were subsidized in some way. Um, you know, people, it's interesting when I talk with folks that are not involved in journalism at all and we're talking about the economy and, and bailouts and things and they're really shocked. Well, why, well, why aren't you on the steps of Washington? Why, you mean you guys aren't getting any, no, we're not getting any help. We're private institutions in a way. So I, I'm not, I mean, this is the way the model's always been and it's always been free and that's part of the problem. We've never... We've never done anything else. That leads me to Ross Reynolds as the next person, but I'd like to see if there are any questions. Yes? What just comes to mind is um, we don't have a problem paying for cable television. We, you know, uh, the telephone, we pay for telephone bills. Um, so we are used to paying for media in certain ways. Um, the internet, yes, um, it didn't start off uh, being used for um, online media content. So. You know, I don't really have an answer to that, but you know, just throwing well, that out. We are used to paying for, for news sources, media sources. Th that's a good point. In fact, maybe there is, that's a potential model, which is the cable TV model, um, where you pay a certain organization a certain amount of money, maybe 20 bucks, 10 bucks a, a, a month, and they distribute it based on their, the, the, the different media that are providing these services. I don't know if that would work, but it's, that's, I think that's one of, the, one, one of the models that people have suggested, that you pay for it, but not as much as if you aggregate everything, it's OK. In fact, that's something we've discussed a lot in the Master Communication Digital Media is, you know, although digital media has changed things, we as a species, as humans, are, are no different. We cannot consume all the information that's being put out there right now. We still need filters. And traditionally, our filters have been the gatekeepers of information, which are journalists and uh, broadcast organizations and everything else, as they go away and as, as more information comes out freely through the internet, we still need something to aggregate that information and analyze it. And so it may be a model such as that that, that helps aggregate it and we pay for that aggregation. I don't know, but that's just something we've considered. There so aren't newspapers already aggregating information, right? right? And, and they're trust, uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. Um, should, I, I have a response, but I want to, maybe either Monica or Corey, can newspapers serve as the, the, the modern aggregators of information? When I read the Seattle Times and I see all that it's syndicated information, I'm not particularly pleased because I would rather have original content that's local and relevant to why I buy the newspaper. And so when I see them trying to aggregate, it doesn't work for me. Do you have a response to that, either of you? I mean, um, <clears throat> I think the reason that aggregation could be valuable for newspapers, even online, uh, is because it can make you uh, a guide. It can give you the authority to be the guide in what's going on in your area, even if you didn't necessarily produce that content. But the more you go over into aggregation and the less you might devote to your own original content, the more you risk what makes you unique and valuable. So it's a real balance. But I think that the consensus is that if you rely solely on your content, that might not be enough to give you authority. Um, and that you have to recognize, acknowledge, and even sometimes in a way collaborate with other sources that are writing about your area, your niche, your subject, in order to be that kind of guide for your readers. Which again, I mean, as uh, David was saying, if it's a networked model then that, that readers are moving toward, then they're probably not going to appreciate some kind of dutiful, I will only, you know, this, this source will only give me, you know, by 
they're obligated to only give me their stuff. I feel like that's, that's no longer maybe the expectation and maybe no longer the best way forward. Corey, did you have anything to add to that or was that the same well, idea? I feel like that, you know, what newspaper websites have done in the last couple of years have decided that they've really taken this huge step forward <laughs> because they're going to link to everybody and give the user everything they need in one place. So we don't need them to go anywhere else because we have our story and then all of these other stories around it. We're, we're really progressive because we're linking out. Um, it's a big deal for some newspaper websites and um, part of the newspaper experience in print is the serendipity of all of these different stories from all of these different places. Um, a website can kind of do that as well. Um, but we're, we're kind of, in, in my own newsroom, moving back to this idea that, um, okay, so maybe that wasn't really so progressive, all this commodity content and, and linking out, and what people really need is what we can do better than anybody else, which is local. I mean, how many times have we heard hyper-local, hyper-local? But that's really the best thing that we can do, sure. Okay, uh, Peg. I'm going to steal your microphones. Sorry, Corey, I think it was on last remote. I don't remember. But didn't, did you, weren't you the one who said uh, local television shouldn't do anything but local? That, you know, they shouldn't be doing world news roundups, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I mean, online, I think the focus should be local, 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 because it's national is available in so many different sources, like msnbc.com. Um, one of the recent things I wrote on Lost Remote for local television stations was that they have a unique opportunity right now to fill the content void. And if they, if the number one or number two station in different markets decided to step up and add a few more resources and do some partnerships and do some aggregation, they might become neck and neck or beat the newspaper in town as the newspaper is struggling to survive. Online. Yeah, online. I mean, notoriously, for television, local television, online has always been very secondary. Um, and this, to me, from the perspective of television, is sort of a, you know, it's a big opportunity that just sort of happened upon them. Uh, the problem is local television is facing uh, economic pressure. It's not to the extent of newspapers, but is very significant. And you're seeing uh, stock prices that are dropping like, you, like newspaper companies are, and you're seeing uh, uh, you know, rounds of layoffs now that are pretty significant. So that's a distraction for them to be able to actually step up right now. I think the mic is already passed, so go ahead. Um, we might have already moved on from this, but just going into back to the you know paying for citizens paying for the journalism that they have, wouldn't that make it something? Wouldn't that be undemocratic in a way? Because I think the beauty of, of newspapers and online is that it's free and anyone can access it. And you know, say if you're a homeless person, you can, you know, today you can still walk into a cafe and pick up someone's secondhand newspaper and get the news. I think paying for paying for news would make it undemocratic. Maybe we can get Ross. I'll get you guys to sound off on your individual questions. Ross or John, do you want to take a stab at that? Well, of course, online news isn't really free, is it? I mean, you need a computer. You need an internet connection. Actually, online news that's so-called free is extremely expensive compared to television, although cable's increasing the price of that. Um, radio still remains a very low-cost alternative for people. I mean, the funding model that, that KUOW has is that when you call 206-543-9500 <laughs> and, and pledge your support, you're are, are among about maybe 10% of the audience that has decided that even though they don't have to pay for it, they're willing to pay for it. So the public service model of, of distinguishing yourself by doing something different than what everybody else is doing in that realm and talking to people about the importance of their support for what you're doing can be really compelling. I mean, KUOW, is currently the number one radio station in Seattle among all radio stations. And public radio stations around the country are very highly, highly rated in their markets. And part of the success is because government stepped in and set aside part of the FM ban for those stations, that's true. Part of the success is that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting provides about 15% of the budget for public radio stations, that's also true. For institutions like ours, part of the success is that we had a home here at the University of Washington for many years that helped to support us. But still, most of the support is coming from people who don't have to pay for the service, but decide to pay for the service because I think we make a convincing argument for it, and they value it. They see it as a public service. So it's been very interesting for me to see that as people scramble and look for some kind of a funding model to replace uh, 
funding models that aren't working anymore, charging for content, they're beginning to think in terms of, well, could we just ask people and would they give money if they found value in it? And hearing some of the reports coming out from the PI reporters who are talking about launching some kind of an online service, they're talking about things like pledge drives. Um, looking at Horace's ass and the little pledge drive they did to pay Josh Fight to go down to Olympia to do the coverage there, which I think succeeded in getting what they needed to do. I think it's going to be really interesting to see whether that model can work on a large scale online because once again, um, there it, we are the advantage for broadcasters still is that we're working within a scarcity model. Right now, it's pretty difficult to listen to audio and other forms streaming to you live uh, in your automobile. Radio is still sort of the premier uh, place for that. And thank goodness for traffic jams or public radio would be kind of in big trouble. So that's, we, we benefit from that. But uh, online, where, when there are so many different sources out there, you are really competing for a lot of other volunteer, voluntarily offered dollars for the service that you're doing. So the conundrum becomes, how do you convince people that you're not like everybody else and maybe it's because you're hyper local or maybe it's because you're doing something that no one else is doing and actually having to convince people that that's worth their voluntary contribution. Now, of course, everybody won't contribute so you need to build into that model the fact that there will be 80, 90, 95% who will just use the service and not pay for it. But if you can kind of unlock that combination of public service and asking in the right way, there's really potential there. So would you, would you conclude, I'll let you after that, John, but would you conclude then that the donation or the public, um, that the, the, the sort of nonprofit model is specific to certain media then? I mean, it's, it's, it, because a lot of people are beginning to wonder, this is the universal answer. Is this the, is this the magic bullet that's going to solve journalism's problem by adopting your model? But what you're saying is that it's quite specific based on a certain circumstances and might not work in the more niche online model. I have some questions about why it will work. I mean, personally, I think for public radio, we need to begin to do more valuable services online and also just begin to get it in people's heads that you know this doesn't happen for free online either and that you need to support it there. There's some pretty interesting experiments going on with this. I think there's a service called Kachingle. I don't know if any of you listen to On the Media on Sunday night, but it's a it's a, a button that's on a website, and I believe you as the consumer, I think you throw $20 in the pot at the beginning of the month, and anytime you come to a blog or an article that you like, you click on Kachingle, and at the end of the month, your $20 or whatever is allocated among all the places that you go. Kind of a very low-key, easy way to do it. I don't know if that is the exact model to make it happen, but that's kind of one way that it can go. Um, and Spot Us is another very interesting experiment that is going on in the Bay Area right now. And the idea behind that is, instead of just paying for whatever the heck they want to do at KUOW, or whatever the journalists want to do, you can propose a story that you would like to see done. And it goes up on a website, and Spot Us calls itself a marketplace to connect journalists to people who want to read or watch or hear their work. So you put up the idea that you'd like to hear coverage of what's in the water at, uh, your, at local schools. A journalist takes a look at that and says, I could do that story for X amount of dollars. And a mini fund drive starts. And when they get to the total amount, the journalist goes out and does that story. You spot us, provides professional editing services, and then distributes it to anyone who wants it, be it radio, newspaper, television. If one of those outlets would like to have that story exclusively, they pay back all of the funders for the service. It's a, it's a very innovative idea. I don't know if it's going to fly, but there are a lot of different ideas like that that I think need to get looked at. And when we figure it out, I think there's, there's going to be some ways to do it. And I know there's a number of questions, but I want to come to John, because my, actually that question works out well, because my question for you is whether we should pay for journalism at all. Well, that's, you know, everyone's trying to figure that out right now. I think for, um, you know, truly unique content like what you see with, with KUOW, people will fork over money for it, and I think that's that's a good thing. The, the challenge that is going on right now is, um, you know, a site like ours where we're competing with, you know, 20 or 30 different other technology news sites uh, to get information out there, you know, you pretty much have to go free because everybody else is free. You can't put your content behind a, uh, a subscription wall. I, I think that might change, though, over time uh, as things start to shake out a little bit um, and the survivors might be able to start doing some interesting things with uh, subscription or payments. 
we talk a lot about true cost of journalism. Can anyone think of any news model in the last century where people have actually play, paid the true cost? Now I've gone through my head and I, I keep thinking, the only thing I can think close to that is the British system where you have to pay licenses on receivers. Even then, a percentage of the money brought into the crown still gets cut out of there. So it's a direct and indirect cost. But I think, so there was that. But I want to come back to something that, that I'm hearing from over here, which is this idea that you could charge. And I keep coming back to this economic issue of substitution, that every time someone's tried to charge, either you generate a lot of freeloaders. I think a few people remember um, something called Bug Me Not, which was a function where you could actually create fake um, login information for some of these newspaper sites, the ones that were behind the walls. Um, because people were, didn't want to be bothered with the cost of having to register, and people didn't want to be bothered with the cost of actually paying. But there was, a fr there was that issue of freeloadering. And then there's the other one of the fact that if the Times and but as an example, my hometown newspaper, the Tulsa World, for a long time threw itself behind an expensive paywall. It, and it really became a joke how, how ridiculous it got because they were believing that they were the only major news source in North, Northeastern Oklahoma. There was only one problem. There are, four, there are five TV stations, and there's a newspaper in Oklahoma City, and there's a newspaper in McAllister and Bartlesville. And so I could still get the same news without ever having to pay him a dime. That's a, that's a good point because, I mean, you can try to put a wall up, but unless you've got an OPEC-like cartel that's going to say, yes, we are going to keep discipline and we're going to make sure that nobody does this, um, information wants to be free, right? Somebody's going to, if, 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 if the Times and the PI all of a sudden put the walls up, then somebody else is going to be producing this information for free. And Corey alluded to Time Select, which was something the New York Times tried a couple of years ago, where they put their premium uh, product, including their, their best columnist, you had to pay for that. And what happened is the Times realized they weren't making that much money off it, and they were losing the, their brand because all the bloggers couldn't link to Thomas Friedman anymore. So you lost somehow. Is, is there any, any sort of response to the idea? I mean, we discussed a little bit about this, putting up the wall, but is there any value or is there any way we could do this? Well, I think you're right about the cartel. I mean, you're, gonna, you're going to have to have everybody do it at once, and that's what newspapers are doing. Anyway, we're just all waiting around going, what, what is the next person going to do? Because we kind of all have to make a move together, or we're waiting for the silver bullet. All of these little bitty ideas that are probably going to save us all are too small for newspapers, in a sense. These organizations are so they're big dinosaurs. <laughs> um, and I also want to go back to the true cost of news for a second. And this is the flip side. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily what you intended. But our news organizations also, we've built huge news organizations. And we've had to trim a lot of the fat. We've had massive layoffs. But I want to say that we haven't necessarily cut in the right way. We haven't really had a choice in, some, in, in, some, in a sense. But if you were to build a digital newspaper, just a digital newspaper, say the, the values of what newspapers bring to the table, um, your meat and potatoes kind of reporting, that stuff of democracy, say. Um, if, if we were to do that and, and not have a printing press, it would be a lot cheaper to produce. There's still a lot of costs there if you want to do some real investigative stuff, if you want to send people to places where they need to go and do these month-long kinds of things that are important to that big J kind of journalism. I just want to say that in the last, we just had the luxury of spending a lot of money and building out huge organizations in, in ways and have rock star reporters and things, which are good because they produce great work, but we spent a lot of money on that. And now we're kind of paying a little bit, a little bit. And, and Monica, I didn't want, I'm not going to get you to speculate on the future of the PI, but I'm just curious. I mean, a lot of the conversation about the survival of the PI is that they get rid of the printing press. Well, they never really had the printing press because you shared the Seattle Times, but you get rid of most of your infrastructure. You come down to a small fraction of your staff and you survive digitally. Um, you uh, have, have carved out this voice, this, this wonderful online voice as a journalist. Uh, should th your infrastructure go away, how comfortable do you feel being that one person army as a journalist and making a living from it? And how, how would you do it? That's, that's a question that I, I ask myself um, a lot when I find myself doing things and just 
being aware of the freedom and independence that I have that maybe other more traditional reporters don't have. And I ask myself every day, do, do I deserve that? Who gave that to me? Who says that I can, I can operate this way? And, and many days I think, my, my goodness, I, I need more. I need more oversight. I, I want to kind of hide behind my byline. I want to know what that's like. You know, for, for many years, um, you know, a lot of reporters, they, they write their articles and it's about the article. It's, it's never, you know, about the reporter. That's changing. And, and I am kind of experimenting with putting myself out there uh, as the reporter. Um, and the reason I'm trying to do that is because I feel like that model where people are sharing news by conversation means that if you want to have a place in that conversation, you must speak. And if you're going to speak, you have to have a face, uh, you know, a voice. You have to be a person. You can't just try to have your content speak for you anymore. Because um, people want that relationship with you, and they want exactly. to believe in you as a, as, a, as a brand and as a person, as exactly. a reporter. Exactly, and so to exist in that space, I feel like, you know, the, the way I kind of put it is reporters must come out from behind their byline. But do I feel comfortable with that? Would any reporter really feel comfortable with that? Well, for a lot of reasons, no, because that means that reporters assume the risks that before the organizations they worked for assumed. Um, you know, the more that we move to this uh, reporters have control model, which I do think the trend is headed there, um, the less, for example, if, if uh, you know, something, something I write is libel, um, people will probably be suing me instead of the paper, you know, and then what am I going to do? Um, and so there's some pretty scary things going on with that. Uh, but on the flip side, I mean, you know, having this voice and this, you know, kind of presence where you're speaking is, is also really exciting. And I do feel like it's bringing people, it's bringing people a little closer around the news. Um, but it's, it's a very complicated issue. So I'm, yeah, I, I won't lie and say that, oh, absolutely, like, no question, this is the way for, I mean, no, there's serious, there's serious concerns and issues. And it might take some time before we really figure out how best to do that in a balanced way. There's a question, there's a mic up there. So I, I see, see other questions, so we'll try to keep it all integrated. Go ahead. Yeah, my question is from a, a business model standpoint, how valuable in the role that local coverage is going to play and how this whole thing shakes out. Because the thinking is that anybody can find out what Obama is doing. You can find that out on msnbc.com or seattletimes.com. It doesn't really matter. That information is national. But you have to go local to find out what Gregoire is doing or what the Seattle City Council is doing or what the Mariners are doing and what Ken Griffey Jr. is saying behind closed doors. If you want that kind of coverage, uh, is there any hope that the, the access that the reporters have and the news organizations have that bloggers don't and that you know, regular citizens do not, but that the reporters do that they get with their press pass and with the backing of their news organizations that they can provide the public can you charge for that, and is, it, is that a viable business model moving forward? Well, let me ask our two professional bloggers here, John, and, well, I know Monica's good, but John or, or Corey. John, what do you think about that? Well, sure. I mean, we're big believers in that concept at TechFlash. I mean, we're a Seattle-focused, Northwest-focused uh, technology news site, so we're, we're of the belief that people want to know what's going on in the technology community locally. And while we do compete against the big names like TechCrunch and GigaOM and VentureBeat and whatnot, we're very much uh, lo local. And so um, we think there is a desire for that. And we think there, is, uh, there, there are advantages by being kind of the beats, you know, uh, the, the boots on the street out there doing hardcore, old-fashioned beat reporting. And in a way, that's kind of how I look at, at blogging. You know, blogging is really just beat reporting. And you know that's why I love it because uh, if you're out there, you're amongst the community, building off a lot of what Monica said. You know, if if you're the if you're the beat reporter out there and you know what's going on, people are going to come to you to get that information. And if people are coming to you to get that information and you do what Monica said and you're participating in the community and you're discussing things and you have a public face, there's real power in that. So, I'm a I'm a big believer in it. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to make money around that concept. I'm hopeful, but uh, I think people are going to start turning to some of these very targeted niche publications for very specific information. But Corey, Corey, you, Berg, I mean, Corey Bergman, you, with myballard.com, which is a hyper-local site, say, I don't know, um, you, 
you know, they want to build a tunnel to Ballard. They want to get rid of the Ballard Bridge. And you, how about you? Would you feel as like, that you were? That's a story. <laughs> it's a hell of a story. I've actually thought about it. I've got caught on that bridge a few times. But if you, if you had, to, would you feel like you could be an authoritative journalist, uh, providing valuable content to your constituents if you went to City Hall and tried to get a, uh, an interview with Mayor Nichols? Would, would you be a, a viable journalist? And can you turn that content around? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of. You know, I wish uh, Tracy Record was here from the West Seattle blog. I mean, you know, we've gone through uh, sort of an introductory period in which uh, governmental agencies don't know who we are and are skeptical, as, as you might imagine. And in both Tracy and my case, we have long backgrounds in journalism, so all we have to do is say, look, here's my resume of where I worked. But imagine people who have not, who have no you know, sort of professional journalism experience and they've sort of built their own audiences by learning themselves how to do this, uh, there is certainly a barrier to entry to gain access to people that they need to talk to. But I will say that the city has, is remarkably coming around and uh, is sending us press releases that are even targeted to our neighborhoods because we have five different neighborhood blogs around the North Seattle area. And I see, you know, sometimes we get sort of all the press releases, but other times we get targeted press releases for sort of hyper-local things that they're actually seeking out and delivering to us. So I think they're, they're starting to learn what, you know, these other pathways are, and um, I, I think those barriers to entry will, will fall. Yeah, th I would just add to that. The press, the press pass is kind of overrated, really. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have never been asked in all my years to, bring, to, to offer a press pass to anybody. And the fact of the matter is people, for the most part, want to talk. And so you could be, you know, anybody walking off the street and just start asking some questions, and typically people will talk. So, but building off that, I, I mean, obviously, my Ballard, if, if you're in the city, city of Seattle and they're not paying attention to my Ballard, I mean, they should be. So, um, I mean, it's a very viable uh, news source, and it's where I live in Ballard. It's where I go to get, get my information. Um, but, um, no. Um, I just want to... Oh, we have a question, but and go to that one next. Yes, great. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, uh, Monica and Corey, have, have the Times and the PI broken down, you know, what sections or, or pieces of the paper are, are really subsidized and which p sections or parts of the paper are, are making money? Um, I, I'd be interested to find out, you know, is, is the, the back page where the weather, you know, information is, is that making you money or is that s being subsidized by the rest of the paper? Why don't you start this one? Sports, right? No. <laughs> well, that's interesting, and it's complicated. Um, so, for the newspaper itself, which I assume you're talking, you're talking about the newspaper itself. I, well, the big difference, obviously, in online and the newspaper, and what just I just love is that you know I know exactly what people are reading right now. <laughs> I can tell you five minutes ago. Um, it's fantastic, and. I make decisions about what goes where based on that and trying to match up. My, my goal for 09 is to really match up, say, uh, what people want and then and, and need and are reading and that we do well with the resources in the newsroom, right? So we spend all this time and money getting our resources in line behind something that people want. And you can do that with online. Uh, with the newspaper, you don't really know exactly what they're reading. It's just a few, it's, it's focus groups, it's um, you know, the so-and-so study. You kind of have to guess. You know that you know, they got the A section, the B section. Um, it's, not, it's not a science like it is with web. Um, so that, that difference there. As far as subsidizing one section to another, um, I can't say exactly for the newspaper. Um, but I can say for the web, there are certain things that do make money and, yeah, that are subsidizing other parts of entertainment. Tons of money. People click on those stories. Those display ads are making money. Uh, not so much necessarily for, say, something like the meat and potatoes I keep talking about, like local news, politics, perhaps. People aren't necessarily that interested. Local politics, policy stories. They're not, they're not reading that, or not as many page views, so can't really set, CPM's lower, but you know, inventory and entertainment is oversold. So that's subsidizing, so I can say that for sure for web. And what Corey, something Corey just said just sparked a, a note in my head. Um, these panels and these conversations are happening around the country right now. 
And uh, somebody who I'm following on Twitter mentioned this article by Steve Rhodes, who's a Chicago blogger and journalist, about a similar panel that happened a few days ago in Chicago. And this guy basically said, you know, instead of Let's not get too, too, too upset that this is the end of the world because newspapers are going away. And this is a very optimistic thing about technology, but I just wanted to read a bit of it to you. The technological tools of the internet age make journalism incredibly superior, superior that what you can do on paper. You can tell stories better, you can do better reporting, you can fulfill your public service mission a thousand times better because you don't have to operate within the artificial constraints of time and space, because you can use multimedia, because you can marshal more evidence to support your reporting, because you can increase your transparency a thousand fold, because your work can reach gazillions more people than a print paper can, because your work has longer life, and those are just a few reasons. Most of all, you can do what reporters are always taught to do but rarely pull off, show, don't tell. So it's just an optimistic spin on it, but something to under, what Corey's talking about, the power of what she can do and the information she gets about how people are using her product. Monica? Um, one of the things that, that I kind of observe, and actually Tracy Record of West Seattle Blog has brought this up numerous times, that the word blog has such a negative connotation. Uh, because for so long, you know, people thought of blog and they thought about people writing about their cats, you know, in the basement, and, and that was it. And so there are, you know, there are blogs that are substantive, that are wonderful, that are amazing. And the only thing that makes them a blog is a format. You know, it's just you're writing chronologically. And um, as, as a reporter, I find blogging to be the most honest form of journalism because rather than pretending like you're writing one finished product and here you go you know here's the article there's the whole thing but over the past you know couple weeks i've been reporting this i'm a reporter but i haven't told you what i've been doing i've been waiting I've been waiting till all the pieces are together and then i release it but when you're blogging and, and if you can if you can really kind of take advantage of the full potential that blogging has you're not just writing short posts about only one topic which i end up doing most of the time but you can take a story and tell it as you're reporting it, you're basically, first of all, you're acknowledging that reporting is a process, not a product, and you're letting people into the process by you know, saying, this is what I know, this is the fact, right? And I've called this one person that I know we need to hear from, they haven't gotten back to me, I'll get back to you when he does. You know, in the meantime, let me know your thoughts. And already you're opening up the process, so people might comment and say, oh my gosh, don't forget to ask him this. Or, oh, I hate, you know, I hate the fact that this is this way and that is that way. And you start to look at the reader comments. It guides your mentality when you go and do that interview when the person calls back and you're a little more kind of informed about what your readers are interested in. And then you give that piece and then it just keeps going. And I just feel that that is, it's so exciting. It can be so rewarding and so much fun that, uh, yeah, that I just, I don't know. I can't imagine ever going back not that I was ever really there, <laughs> but ever going back to a time when there was no way to do that. I think it's a wonderful observation. We have very few textbooks in the MCDM, but one that I love is called The Wealth of Networks. It's actually available free as a PDF, and it's by a Yale Law professor named Yohai Benkler. And he says the difference between industrialized gatekeeper type communication for the 20th century and what we have now is that uh, Journalism and just communication generally before was in self-contained finished messages, finished products that you distributed to your audience and let them consume. Now it's all unfinished communication, unfinished messages. It's an ongoing conversation. And that's, it seems that's something that Monica enjoys quite a bit. So it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, distinction to make in terms of how things have changed. I, my co oh. I just wanted to jump in here because I think this, this question of what could people be interested in paying for online is really kind of crucial to this discussion. People will always be interested in a great personal storyteller, whether it's a column in a newspaper or whether it's a blog. But this question of uh, suppose you could buy the newspaper a la carte, you could either buy the sports section or the entertainment section or the local news section or the national section. That is actually, of course, what happens on the web. It's disaggregated, this collective thing. You couldn't choose with the newspaper, so you had these somewhat hidden cross subsidies. The thing about entertainment news or sports news or fashion news, which is really popular, is that it's utterly manufactured news. There's a new sports season, there's always gonna be a new story, there's always gonna be a new movie coming out, they'll always be pushing that story, so there's kind of continual level that they can push out there. When it comes to less sexy stuff, like what's going on at city council, you know, people might not, not at all be interested in that until something comes up about the viaduct, and then they're really interested in it. 
But what happens is that that on the web, I think, is, becomes much less desirable and kind of falls to the bottom. Um, I question even whether investigative reporting, the most expensive and I would argue probably the most vital part of journalism, is something that people will be willing to pay for online. They're just, uh, we just have to figure out models for that or the whole guts of journalism is just going to be ripped out. Uh, yeah, I want to return to uh, some phrases that have been used and, and explore them just a little bit more. Let me start with the last phrase that I'll just completely grant and agree with about the importance of great personal storytelling. But here's some other phrases. Uh, reporters coming out from behind the byline. Reporter control. Singular journalist with the individual voice. And both tonight and in some of the other uh, reading I've been doing about sort of rescuing or saving journalism and what kinds of models work, um, the, the kind of centrality of the reporter and moving the reporter into the foreground rather than the background is often emphasized. And, and I have a worry about that that I'd love to hear you comment on, and that is that what we're doing is we're uh, substituting a celebrity model um, it, with and appending it to a business model because, boy, do we know how to sell celebrity and make money from it. Uh, we do know that part. Uh, and I wonder if there's just a little drift sometimes that you worry about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that it, I think that, that can be, I think if every reporter, if every single reporter was all about you know, establishing his personality, his or her personality, first of all, that takes time. That takes effort. Um, you know, when I'm on Twitter, that takes time. Um, and so I, for example, I don't think that the way that I'm doing what I'm doing, I could have time to do in-depth investigative reporting. Uh, if I did, I wouldn't be able to maintain so much of the personality. So absolutely, I think that what we're talking about is still not just one, one model, one mold of journalist. I think we're talking about different models and different molds. If I were a news organization of the future, I would want a little of everything. And I would want some of my beat reporters to be personalities so that they could glide their content into the conversation so that it could be shared and linked and commented on and read, quite frankly. And I would leave some of my reporters time to do the analysis. Because when you're spending your time making sure that you're in that conversation, um, you know, by definition, you're Again, it just it just takes it just takes investment, um, and so you're not going to have that kind of time to sit and analyze. And I think actually that one of the things going on is that there's there's some resistance still in in the journalistic world, and very understandably, to this idea that there is such a like a buzz world, and most of it's taking place online, right? I mean, if somebody tweets something and it's wrong, but it's but it's sexy and it's crazy and oh my gosh, really this happened? It spreads like wildfire, and before you know it, you know misinformation's made it all the way across the country. Um, and so obviously, you know, as as journalists, we just we resist that because we're like, oh, you know, nobody's checking anything. There's no process for this. Oh gosh, let's keep trying to regain our power and our filter. It used to be that we, the media were the filter. And now everybody's just kind of talking to each other and they're trusting their friends more than, more than us and what's going on. But, but what I think is, why not surrender to that? Surrender to the fact that the eyes and ears news is going to happen a lot on this level where people are just going to talk about it and maybe they're not going to figure out something's wrong is wrong until, you know, a little bit later. Maybe there's, maybe there's going to be some lag. Maybe there's going to be some misinformation. But what if we accept that? so that we have enough of a presence so that when somebody just, you know, an ordinary person just reads one crazy thing, they think, I wonder what Mani Guzman thinks, you know? And they'll go maybe check out that Twitter feed and say, oh, look, she wrote a post about this. Oh, okay, well, let me, let me make this viral. Um, if journalists don't have a presence in that buzz, and, that, and that's a really important point. We were, I just came from a faculty meeting at Department of Communication. We were talking about, you know, what's in, at the crux of all of this transformation in communication is really trust. And so what Monica is saying is that I'm trying to, you know, if she establishes her, herself as a singular trusted brand, that's a really effective way, a new model of communication, that if something is being buzzed about out there, 
somebody wants to check what Monica says because they trust her. Yeah, and what I was, just to finish my point, um, what I would suggest then is, you know, if, if I were a news organization of the future, make sure there's some reporters in that buzz, you know, like having a, that voice and being able to kind of steer conversation uh, toward the more correct or the more useful, but then also have people who work in a level that, that work in a place where that can't reach, which is analysis, which is context, right? That's the kind of stuff you can't fit into 140 characters on Twitter, not in your life. So make sure that, like what if newspapers just, or news organizations give up their domination, just give up the domination on, on the buzz, but establish domination on that higher level? Maybe that's the future. Go ahead. Uh, unless the microphone's gone somewhere else, I haven't seen it. I better, I better follow the mic, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is back to paying for journalism is maybe, um, thinking about a partnership between one of the other great institutions of, dem of our democracy, which is libraries, who are already serving up a lot of aggregated content um, in online databases with taxpayer money, and maybe there's a way of kind of extending that. Oh, I never considered that. That's um, interesting. Model and using and paying for news through tax dollars. And you could even do the hyper-local thing, you know, serve up some local news through local libraries. But I think there's real potential. Um, for that, for that kind of thing. And How anybody want to take a stab? Public a partnership with a public institution like a library? That's, that's fascinating. It would be interesting to know what information is out there and what could be mined and how it could be used. Yeah. I'd love to follow up on what Monica was saying about this idea of, of community. And I, I was going to read the stats, but I'm, I will, I'm forcing myself not to. But a Forrester research study came out a couple of weeks ago that really just ripped into newspapers and said that they did not provide, do not provide the connective tissue in a community. They asked people who are online and, and read online newspapers locally how relevant local papers are. It was less than 50% said they're, they're relevant. How local they are it was 30 some odd percent. How much they provide com community to connect with their neighbors and other people who have like mind and, and are concerned about similar issues, 20 some percent. So, you know, I think we can talk about business models, but I think there is still some core things that need to be solved from a content perspective as well. First of all is connecting people to businesses, which I think can be done in a content and economic way. And second of all is sort of, you know, this, I, I like the idea from a hyper-local standpoint of, you know, where Monica's taking sort of a, a non-neighborhood approach, we're taking sort of a neighborhood reporter approach, where our goal is to provide an infrastructure for community and that we provide a layer of journalism over the top of an empowered community. We want people to be able to, to talk about things and self-organize and discuss things. We want people like we did the other day, the people actually organized the neighborhood watch group on My Ballard, or the guy who was starting a new business, this uh, corner store, who asked My Ballard uh, readers what he should have in the store. And uh, 70 some comments later, he had crowdsourced his inventory <laughs> with people who lived within five blocks of the store. I mean, what better sort of starting point can you have for a business? Uh, and there are example after example after example. People that aren't only commenting about things, they're connecting with other people. That leads to action. And those are the types of things that I think are extremely tangible. And, you know, for us, we try to stay back as much as we possibly can and try to make sure that, you know, things don't get out of control and that we provide almost like an answer service. Because we get a lot of emails from people saying, I just saw this thing here and I don't know what this is. Is this true? So what we do is we go and we make a couple calls, and it's usually pretty easy to find out if it's true or not, and we post it. So then people all of a sudden are using us as an answer service, which generates more story ideas, which keeps all this original content flowing, and then people in comments can continue to report about the story by saying, I live right next door to that. You, this is what's going on, and I know this person here, and they should hear what this is going on. But people know the difference between the journalism that we post and what's going on in comments. They know the comments aren't vetted and the forum's not vetted, but it all sort of cycles back around and reinforces each other. Of our content on My Ballard, about 90% of the stories are originated from tips that come to us. And of the page views on the site, uh, minus the home page, about 70% of the content consumption is not content we produced. It's from our users. So you talk about trying to decrease the cost of doing business and to be able to produce more relevant content in a way of what this proximity driven where people don't normally comment about something until it's on their block. And then they may, you know, they may not have commented on a blog forever. And all of a sudden, they feel compelled to write something. And I mean, that's what we're seeing to the point at my Ballard where I think it, you know, where our traffic grew 30% last month, 35% the month before. I mean, these are growth rates that are just you don't see in any traditional media right now. And it's, it's completely surprising to me 
And I, you know, I think that there, it could be some sort of a marriage of a model, of a hyper-local model like this, and some sort of a, you know, a reduced staff beat focus uh, that a, a newspaper like the PR of the Times could have. And, and I don't, and I don't, oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, how many are there? There's about, there's varying levels of success and quality, but there's about 20. I don't want to give short shrift to that suggestion about the library. I think that's actually a great idea. And something that David Domke and I have been discussing is also using the, um, the un higher education, the university can play a role in the future of journalism as well by being involved in the content creation that can be spread out that's happening at Boston University with investigative reporting. So that's a, a great suggestion. never thought of that. Go ahead, Sanjay. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Sanjay, and I want to thank you all for putting this program on. I think that what I would just like to say, I don't have any solutions, and I, I, I personally love the web, even though I've spent 12 years working for newspapers. I would just like to see um, more transparency, perhaps, from uh, more discussion from newspaper journalists uh, about things that perhaps the public doesn't realize, sort of educating the public about really the, co the true cost of investigative reporting. Because I think what we've heard about the danger of investigative reporting dying as we're trying to make this transition, it doesn't really fully capture the real drama behind the scenes. And newspapers, which spend hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars defending libel lawsuits, you know, that's the sort of thing they're not going to talk about because they don't, certainly don't want to give an incentive to people to sue them to squelch a story. I personally was the subject of a libel lawsuit that was filed against my newspaper and me nine years ago, and that was finally settled this year. Hmm. Can you imagine a blogger, how long they would last under those sorts of conditions? I also, um, I also want to say that I think that the idea of having a conversation with your reader as a reporter is, is an attractive idea. The only problem um, I see, and these are the sorts of things that we'll learn as, we, as journalism evolves, but a lot of the best investigations come out of beat reporting. And because you're the, you're the closest to the, the action. I remember as a reporter in South Florida covering uh, public health and covering the medical board and going to these um, board of medicine meetings around the state. So my newspaper paid to send me to Orlando, Flo um, Tampa, Tallahassee. There was no guarantee of getting some great scoop. The newspaper just sent me because it was important for the public to know who their doctors were that were being disciplined and just sort of what issues were being discussed. And lo and behold, in the middle of all this 500 pages we were going through one day, I spotted that a state senator who was a doctor had let his license lapse and was practicing medicine without a license. Um, I just think that journalists, newspaper journalists, newspapers need to do more work educating the public about what not just the process of reporting, but the real cost of investigative reporting, because I think that's something we're going to lose, and people don't realize the true costs because newspapers don't want to don't want to give people an incentive to sue them. So that's all I wanted to say, and I just I just I just think that it's fabulous that you all are having these discussions. Um, one little plug: I, there's a website for uh, newspaper reporters who've been laid off to uh, write about their, these sorts of issues called. Uh, the Inkstain Wretches Club, and it's at bleedingink.ning.com. And uh, I just love this dialogue we're, we're having. Thank you. Great. And I'll let Sanjay, as a def I'll, I'll let him be a de facto panelist, and so I'll let that stand as an observation. But I will bring it to John, because, John, you have the luxury of being on the bleeding edge as a blogger, uh, and you say you don't know whether this is going to work or not, but you have, you have an institution behind you that's going to protect you to a certain extent. Um, so I'm curious. I mean, is the model that you actually need a patron, like Mozart had the Archduke of Austria paying for his music, that you need some institution to be able to subsidize what you're doing so you can practice your journalism safely? I, I, sure, I sure think it helps. And Sanjay, that was, that was one of the things that scared me when I was thinking about going out completely on my own as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur and doing this all on my own. Was I was afraid of getting sued and, and you know, buckling under those pressures. <clears throat> Uh, and that's why we did go ahead and we partnered with the with the business journal. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have that kind of power behind you. Uh, so I think we're going to see more models like that, where you see, um, you know, a, a, a kind of a very aggressive daily beat reporter out there reporting on something online, and then partnering with a weekly or a magazine or a KOW or or what have you, 
Um, and, you know, I just think there are a lot of models there, but something you said really resonated with me in terms of just being a beat reporter out there in the community on the street, because my colleague and I, Todd, Todd, Todd Bishop and I, that's what we're about. I mean, we're really out there in the community reporting on stories, and like people go to Ma My Ballard to tip them off about, you know, the store that's opening around the corner in, in Ballard or, or, or Finney Ridge, people are coming to us to give us those tips because they know we're aggressive enough to go and pursue them, and we do. And as much as people are afraid about the disappearance of, of investigative reporting, I can speak a little bit from experience here, just what we've, what we've done with TechFlash over the last three or four months. I've done some of the, probably some of the more hard-hitting journalistic stories of my career uh, in the last three or four months. I've, I've covered stock frauds. I've covered uh, uh, a company in Bellevue that was basically you know, ripping off youth sports leagues. Uh, and this, is, this stuff just basically bubbles up, I think. And I think that's what a lot of people forget about investigative journalism. Um, for the most part, it's been a top-down structure. It's, it's driven by prizes for the most part. And it's people that sit around you know, in conference rooms and decide, we're gonna go after this you know, sacred cow and we're gonna take them down. I just have the exact opposite view of that. I think it, it bubbles up from the bottom, from doing that daily beat reporting. And if you're out there in your, in your community, people are gonna tip you off to the good stories and you're gonna be able to go out and tell them. And the great thing about the social media element of it is once you start telling the story, the, 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 the fraud case of Intellium is what I was referring to earlier, I, I would tell a piece of it, and then comments would just flood in. Hey, John, you're missing this part. And then you follow that, and you follow the rest of the tip. And the combination of those 20 or 30 posts that I do on Intellium might be the equivalent of a 120-inch you know, a news story in the newspaper. It's just fragmented, but it's still getting told, and I'm using the community to help me tell it. I love that. I'm just following the mic at this point. Here we go. Um, I guess I have a question about how you all feel about basically just like what is the purpose of journalism? It seems like for a long time it's been to inform people and now I see it more as a way to engage people and of course keep them informed at the same time. And I just wonder if a for-profit model, I mean really the purpose of any for-profit model is to make money for the people who own the business. And I just wonder if the quality of journalism isn't affected when that's the ultimate goal. And I'm not, I, I wonder just your opinions on whether or not those, you know, sort of the purpose of journalism or the mission of journalism can exist simultaneously with a bottom line. Or if the nonprofit model really is what makes sense if you view, view, if you view journalism as a public J service. Journalism has existed for, you know, all these years being a profit, profit driven business. So, right, um, but I guess, I mean, it just, Touching on the true cost idea, I mean, the fact that now that advertising isn't supplying that, um, you know, I just wonder, well, I don't know, I guess it's the question we've all been asking is how are you going to pay for it? And if you start searching for ways that are going to pay for it, is the... Will that compromise journalism? Yeah, will that compromise the because quality? Because you're really trying, of it? if you're trying to make a profit in that environment, you're going to compromise yourself even more than you did in the previous pro pro profit model. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Well, I see the mic in Corey's hands. Well, here's the deal we're a bunch of liberal arts people sitting around trying to solve a business problem. <laughs> I mean, seriously, <laughs> that's a problem. When people ask me, you know, what do you need to make this web thing work? And I'm like, I need, I need development resources. And I'm just talking strictly technology because I want to run and gun and I want to do cool stuff and I want to move content forward. But then they ask me, of course, like, well, what do we need in the business realm? How are we going to make money off of your, how can I give you the, well, you know what? Those business people, they need those resources too. They need to be having this conversation that we're having. And I'm sure that they are somewhere, I'm sure. But <laughs> they need to be investing in development. And I mean crazy stuff. Like we're doing crazy content stuff and that's fun. And you know, you're in business development now, thank you. You know, we, <laughs> we're trying really hard, but the truth of the matter is it's really, this is a business problem. This is not a readership problem. You know, my web readership has grown. We're talking leaps and bounds. You know, we have more readers than we have ever had. It's not a readership problem. It's a money problem. And so, you know, people in the newsroom forever, hundreds of hundred years have said, we don't care about that. We're doing journalism. And, you know, it's real church and state, and we don't want to know anything about the money. That's gross. We just do journalism. 
And we don't say, I mean, I grew up on the web. I was a print reporter for nine or four years. And then I really, I grew up on the web. And I don't really have that icky feeling. <laughs> then that, then that makes people in the newsroom proper icky, that I don't have that icky feeling. I just don't. It's, it's an important point. I mean, I think this is, the, this is the fundamental resistance that you're seeing in traditional journalism is that that wall that has traditionally existed between the business side and the content side is coming down. And now, if you're taking, looking at journalism from a more entrepreneurial model, if, if you want to create content, you almost have to ask it the same question about what kind of content you're going to create is who's your audience. When you start asking who my audience is going to be for that content, you're asking business questions. And so the two are beginning to get tied in, and that's what gets people feeling icky. Monica? What's happening now is that the roles of moderator and guide are dissipating. And instead of being held just by a newspaper, they can be actually owned and held by people, by reporters or by bloggers or by anyone or by people on Twitter, you know, if they become, like, trusted enough. Anyone can be a guide or a moderator or a reporter. So journalists... I guess we have to figure out, you know, do we want to be all three? Just one? Combination of the three? How do we balance it? it or do we want to put all three in one person? Or all three just in one organization with each, you know, different people taking different roles? So, yeah, I think that's a great question. Mr. Lawson. Hi. Um, I'm enjoying all the different conversations we're having here tonight. I think that the, the last question that we had is brought us to a really interesting and fruitful point um, about what, what the relationship is between journalism meaning like the meat and potatoes stuff, the enterprise journalism, the um, investigative stuff, and the meat and potatoes of you know, what's happening in the city council and the state government. This is a place where the bottom has just fallen out. We've lost a lot of reporters in Olympia recently and so forth. What's the relationship between that stuff and the business side is a question that has a lot of different answers. You know, There's like the firewall um, church-state approach, which is very important, but now we're in this magnificent whirlwind of different answers and every every lots of different things are happening the stuff that's happening with tech flash is a great example of entrepreneurial journalists for the sake of principal journalism figuring out an economic model that'll support them what i wanted to ask about though is it seems that it'll always be true that regardless of all the little entrepreneurial things that are happening all the josh fights all the spot.us's that are out there there is there are not going to create a web that's going to cover all of the needs for this kind of meat and potatoes journalism. And it seems like this is a prime candidate for looking to models like the British model where, um, where there is like a universally understood reason to have a publicly funded source for good journalism. I'm not talking about the U.S. newspaper or even the BBC. But is there, uh, my friend Alex Stonehill has called for thinking about the idea of a national endowment for journalism. Um, and I'd like to hear uh, anybody's response to this, but I know that there are discussions that are kind of sort of like this coming from within the public broadcasting community. Maybe the more interesting ones are coming from outside the public broadcasting community, but I know that Ross has been paying attention to this, this kind of question. So I wonder what are some of the arguments for and against a kind of public supported journalism that would not supplant commercial journalism, but would augment it and make sure that the bottom line stuff is happening. I think the history of public radio in the United States really has a lot of lessons for why we would be wary of something like that. Um, National Public Radio got its first funding directly from the federal government. This was in the Nixon era, and almost immediately there were efforts to pack the Corporation for Public Broadcasting board. There were efforts to squelch some of the reporting that was going on. So there were, the, that kind of direct funding to NPR was removed, and very cleverly, it went out to radio stations. So all of a sudden, radio stations with strong local constituencies were getting the money directly, and NPR had a little bit of insulation. Um, I don't know whether, I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea of public funding all of journalism, and that's simply because if it's public funding, and this, in our f uh, form of government, it's, it's going to involve the democratic representatives of the people. And the democratic representatives of the people, at least under our current environment, are heavily influenced by the kind of funding that gets them elected. And hence, when it comes to deciding where that money will go and, and whether or not these journalists are doing what they should be doing, it's going to become a pitched political issue. And I worry about that not really getting us to where we want to be. It sounds like what Ross is saying is that the BBC model wouldn't really fly here politically, and we'd have to be very aware in terms of how. 
Yeah, um, I, and I think that there is some great journalism being produced by some of these public service oriented journalism outlets that are funded by foundations. But foundations also have a, a, a set agenda for what they're going to do and a set of agenda for what they're not going to do. Why won't that inevitably start to reflect the interests of those rich people? If the money is coming from the rich people, eventually I think there'll be a level of control, even though journalists are supposedly in charge. I mean, I think it's, Marx was right. I mean, there, there will be a connection. It would probably be a good thing, actually, because then you'd see differentiation in the market between the products here, and that's been what has been so, so, uh, frankly, I mean, I thought the PI missed the biggest marketing, it was the biggest marketing blunder ever when, uh, what is, Bill O'Reilly came out and he, and he called the PI the most liberal, the, yeah, the most liberal newspaper, most liberal newspaper, or most liberal newspaper in America, and I was like, God go around this city and put it on every billboard. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about Seattle here. I mean, you talk about a marketing dream, there it was. But they weren't taking those kind of risks to do that kind of thing. So I, frankly, I think it would be good to have somebody that would step in that had an agenda running one of the newspapers and had a real voice and, and made it the left paper or the right paper or what have you. And you just know what you're getting then as the reader. Well, we got the, and that's great. It's a great example. And that is, that's the European model as well, where traditionally newspapers in Europe have taken uh, a political party as their body. And, but they're also having, I mean, I understand in France, they're, they're, they're suffering from the same problems, even though they follow a particular party. So it may give you better voice, but it, I don't know if it solves your business problem. Um, well, I think it does to some degree in that if you are more targeted, which you would be, because you would have a, more of an agenda, I think you could sell against that a little bit easier. So I'll follow on the mic here. Go ahead. Thank you. As we get more digitalized, if that's a term, it seems like the demands on the infrastructure are only going to increase perhaps beyond what um, we're capable of, the internet service providers, wireless carriers. So I'm wondering, what are the trends in income generation coming from that direction where the providers of the service to the readers charge for the content, rather than making the readers pay the, the news organizations directly. So you're talking like Comcast, for example, would right. charge kind of like you know, do Verizon, for cable? Yeah. But so they take a, like a fee. Anybody want to take a stab at that as a model? I, I mean, Comcast is the one who's making the money for the Seattle Times. You see, like the content online is not free. You're paying for it, but you're paying Comcast. Right, you're, right. That's what I'm saying. You're paying. Uh, you're paying for your modem. You're paying for your, your MacBook. Your so all those all those things that, that that give you the internet are that that's the charge. So, and I, you know it's not really fair, but it wasn't really thought out as a business model, right? I don't I'm, perhaps, but that's true. Did you ever think yeah, about asking Comcast? I, I think it's going to be a real hard sell to try to get money out of Comcast to start, <laughs> start supporting local journalism. I, I don't think we should look at that as, a, as an alternative model. I just don't see them going there. Okay. On the back, yes, with the mic. Uh, this is for Monica and the two Corys. Uh, if hyper local bloggers are journalists, why won't newspapers link to them? If hyper local bloggers. Do, well, Corey, have you had that problem? Corey Bergman, have you had a problem with local? Why are newspapers, have you, has any newspaper, local Seattle paper, approached you to link to some of the stuff on my ballot? The PI linked the West Seattle blog this weekend. Oh. We linked to the West Seattle blog, and you, you, I, li I linked both to you and to. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I, I guess my blog's been linking for some time, but yeah, the PI but, just started. Yeah, linking. the homepage above the full story yeah. links are going to different blogs and sites right now on the PI, and I think that's a preview of things to come, not just if the PI decides to go online, but also uh, elsewhere, as Corey was saying. Times, Jeff Baker does it every day. Times, Jeff Baker, the sports blogger. Yeah. And different, different bloggers at the PI do it all the time. And I liked when Corey Bergman was working at King 5, he created Citizen Rain, and Citizen Rain used to carry you know, links and, and stories from competitors of King, and I think that was a fairly revolutionary thing. So. I think we're seeing some of those walls break down. People realize content is content. If it's good, you need to provide it to your audience. Yes, the other Corey. Um, I will say, I, I love to link to the blog. If it makes sense, 
if it makes sense content-wise. The problem is there are so many blogs, and I don't know what content is in there. It has to be pitched, um, and someone has to, you know, hand, you, you know, let me take this link and add it to this thing. It's, there's no automation of that in a sense, right? We don't produce it in that way. So it's all kind of by human, and they have to know it's there. And so that takes a little work. But there is no policy against that at all. Content is content. And if it makes sense for the user, we're, we're for it. It took a while in this <clears throat> discussion uh, for us to hear the word trust. Uh, Hanson, I think you were maybe the first, although Monica, you might have been. Um, you, you, you mentioned people you know, becoming trusted, getting trusted. And Corey, what, what, what you're doing uh, with my Ballard and, and uh, Citizen Rain, the, the level of trust, uh, kind of a self-perpetuating uh, uh, self, uh, or, or, or self-actualizing level of trust starts to rise with, with, these, new, with these new models. But, there's still a lot of distrust out there. The Edelman Global Trust Index, which just came out last week, they've been doing this for six or eight years. You know, media are the lowest of all the kind of sectors. Now, other studies have showed that, but this is just a constant challenging problem. I run the Washington News Council. We're kind of an outside ombudsman for the media in this state, and you know, we're kind of a 20th century model still. We're trying to figure out what is our best role, but you know, we're citizens who really, really want good media and want media we can trust, rely on, and count on. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what, what do you guys have any recommendations? And, you know, how 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 to, uh, you know, there's no way anybody can kind of vet everything that's out there. But there's a kind of interesting, intriguing idea. There's a guy who calls himself the journalist iconoclast uh, who proposed a, a self-stamped seal. Uh, you know, not a good housekeeping seal of approval exactly, but if you agree to abide by certain standards, no matter who you are, SPJ code, you know, basic standards of journalistic ethics that we all want to see in whatever the delivery system, accuracy, fairness, balance, thoroughness, professionalism, you know, just basically kind of do unto others kind of stuff if you're, you know, unless you're just a total opinion blogger and that's fine. I, I love opinion. The more the better. But, you know, if you're trying to present factual stuff, is there a way maybe, you know, kind of a self-branding? Okay, I agree to abide by these principles. I'm going to put this stamp on what I do. And if, if I violate it, uh, let me know, you know. Um, I don't know. You know, this is this is one idea, but it's, it's uh, a pre and it's a perennial question that's even before the internet got involved was whether journalism in America should be regulated, even self-regulated. And I think it's been something that's been resisted. So the question is now in this free-for-all Wild West journalism, yeah. is there a brand other than just be Monty Guzman that says that we are trusted and we can be held? Well, I, I'd like to bring up maybe a, a radical line of thought, but um, if you think about elections, right? There's uh, there's talk of Democratic and Republican column, and how that's a shortcut. You know, you don't have to study all the candidates necessarily. You go into an election and you say, I'm Republican. I can just vote down the line Republican, right? And that's a shortcut. In the same way, newspapers in a way have also always been shortcuts. Well, I know I can trust whatever's in the PI or the Times uh, because it's a newspaper. So, cool, I'm just going to dive right in. But then there's the other side. People say that in elections, if you have a shortcut of Democratic and Republican, maybe Maybe you're not, that means that you might not actually be looking very closely at each candidate. Maybe you really didn't do any studying of them at all. And does that make you a less involved citizen? Um, and so I think the same kind of parallel question can be applied to news. We're moving to an era where trust is earned, not assumed. And like you said, there is no way to vet everything. No way. But in a way, we're kind of moving to a place where there's all these candidates and none of them have a, have a political party. None of them. So in other words, I think that the reader, the news reader is being asked to do more. And I'm not sure that we're going to go back to the shortcuts we had. Interesting. I like your stamp of approval idea. Um, I think it's kind of understood for people that do very serious journalism online. And for those who don't, I think those people will either fall away or they'll become, you know, just part of the chatter out there. And those people who do serious journalism, I think, will rise to the top. And I think uh, that's just going to happen more and more sort here of over, self over time. self-selection kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Yes? Um, I'd, I'd like to get back uh, to the question of how we're going to pay for it. And um, I, we touched a little bit on uh, micropayments. I'm wondering, do you guys think it's way too late for 
like say the AP to band all newspapers together and form kind of like an iTunes method where you don't have to log in separately to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and all that. You just log into PayPal or iTunes or whatever and you pay your one cent to read that story. I'd love, to, I'd love it if we could find a way for the readers essentially to be paying for the content as opposed to the advertisers or the rich guys. Sounds like a column that Paul Andrews had on Tech Flash the other day. Uh, but um, I, think you, I think you could see that, actually. Uh, as the assets drop for media properties, uh, it would be interesting to see if somebody could emerge and get all of those people organized or buy them on the cheap and start to set up that sort of system. It's, it's a tall, tall task, though. And you want to try the icky question, or you don't, don't want to touch that? Well, I just, I, I mean, yes, maybe, but then I think that you're just going to lose all of those people that we just won. That we, when we saw your graph where the line crossed, I, I, I think we're going to lose a lot of those people that are just getting engaged. You know, um, it, we're just used to free, and that's the problem. And so I just don't know if you can go back. Some people will, but at, at what cost? I mean, it's really this is bigger and it's about we, we're engaging people in this this new process, this kind of new journalism, this new interaction, um, this this process and the product is evolving and that's the coolest thing. And it kind of stinks that we've got to figure out this business thing in the middle of it because what's happening, what's emerging are new ways to tell stories and to get information out. That's what's exciting to me. Um, how is that really changing things? We don't exactly know yet, but we're just beginning to see it. I mean, you're you're kind of you're doing that work, and so it, so we do an iTunes model, and okay, so that saves some media organizations, and we're all afloat. But we're going to interrupt a lot of um, innovation, I think, in the communication. Yeah, let, let me just add David really quickly Duncan. that yep. I think the bigger issue here is what is the need that needs to be filled with. Consumers, and by consumers or customers, I'll say they're both people who read and people who advertise, right? And I think there hasn't been any discussion tonight, and you will see very little discussion, really, about what that should be. And I think we should take a step back and broaden what that should be. And a lot of people don't just want pure news. People want information to help them make better decisions, and there's a difference there. And if you sort of broaden that out to make information to make better decisions, those decisions are not only about things that they would do civically or in their community, but it also might be things that they go purchase. And of course, there is a line there, and we need to look at the line. But I think this, this sort of the wall between business and news has been too high. And I think that there needs to be almost, maybe it's a different group of people that are not journalists and are not pure sales that are more biz dev type of folks that try to seek out opportunities to make connections between, you know, fill needs of what users are looking for and fill needs of what advertisers are looking for and really sort of crack the puzzle of how we can help small and medium businesses succeed, especially in this economic climate, and how we can help people succeed at home as they struggle through this economy. I think there's a real opportunity there. And if you start providing relevant information there that people really can use and put to work, uh, then I think you've got something. But until we figure that out, trying to make people pay for it or trying to twist advertisers' arms, I think that's going to be a problem. David, do you think, based on what you've seen in your studies, that these, these newly engaged younger people, it seems, would that scare them away if they were actually forced to pay? Well, I have a couple questions that they're kind of bullet point questions, to Twitter-ish questions. Corey, you said the problem is that we're used to free, and I have to ask you, why is that a problem? It's only a problem for people that are trying to make money off of this. For democracy, it's not a problem, okay? So I'd like to get your response to that. So for people trying to make money off of journalism, it's a problem. And, but for democracy, I love it, okay? So response to that. Second, John brought up the point of it'd be great for the PI to go conservative or, or, or claim the, the banner of liberal. That's what it used to be in America a long time ago. Partisan newspapers, partisan news organizations. There is a business model that works. Fox News has shown it to us, right? So why, why don't we go that business model? What's the problem with that business model? Because that works. Right now, today, it works. So why don't we go that route? So those are the two things that, you know, let's, let's stop dancing around this. What's the problem with democracy flourishing like this or partisan press? Okay, who wants to take that first? John or, or Corey? Corey, you got the mic. Go for it. I, I just, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> because I haven't been laid off yet, or you know, I, I, so it's still working right now. 
<laughs> it's right. It's right. The free thing is right. It's that's that's the beauty of it, and that's why your graph is working. It's there, and people can engage and do things with it. We've never had that before, so we're gonna. That it's gonna continue to cross like that unless we charge for it. Still, for now. Yeah, I guess the only the only challenge with that you said you know free is great, but you do have to pay journalists at some point. I mean, it's not people just don't do this out of civic pride, and and you do need to make money doing it, right? And so, if the advertising models don't work around online, you do have to look at another model. And I, I think there are, I think there are many of them that you can experiment with. I think what Corey's talking about is is really interesting. Helping people lead, leading people to making purchasing decisions is, is really fascinating. I mean, there's no reason that um, news, and you see this on some news sites, usually they're, they're somewhat discredited, but as you, as you sc scan through a, a news article, uh, a word will be double underlined. And if you click on that, uh, click on that word, it might take you to amazon.com. And if you make a purchase on amazon.com, you might get an affiliate revenue on that. I, I, I don't really have a problem with that, actually. I, I think that's okay. You didn't mention anything about Fox News. Uh. Oh, Fox News. I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let you take Fox News since you're on the okay. counterpoint of Fox. Right? No. Oh, well, well, don't ever accuse Ross of being political. <laughs> um, yeah, let, let uh, a million voices bloom and let, let there be more partisan journalism out there. But I want to go back to the icky feeling. I got the icky feeling. And I think the wall falling between editorial and the business sides is a terrible thing. And I think inevitably the goal of raising money is going to pollute the journalism. It's just going to happen. The whole point of that wall is to keep the business side from influencing the judgment of the journalists. And I don't see how, when that wall is torn down, you don't have that influence begin to permeate. Now, there may be some people who are doing high quality journalism and have a certain ethical code of their own. But when the financial incentive comes around for the blogger, I was at the I was at uh, in Austin at the uh, at a media conference and saw a booth where bloggers could go over and sign up in order to blog on things products that people wanted to be sold. They were right there to buy those bloggers out and so those bloggers could sell their stuff. And I'm I'm afraid that like if we don't if we sort of say that the wall's not important, then that thing's going to happen more and more. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, in, in fact, it was a it was a struggle of my own as I as I was saying earlier, as I was looking to go out and, and do something entrepreneurial in journalism. I was seriously looking at doing a online technology news publication on my own. The re I had I could have raised the money to do it. The problem I ran into was I didn't have the business guy with me, and I felt I had that icky feeling. I didn't want to go out there and be the guy who was out there selling my endeavor to the people I was covering. And so I think it's, but, we, but we're now we're still doing a model that's a variation of it. And we have the ability of, to draw on the resources of the business journal to go out and sell what we're doing. And so I think there are models out there that can emerge that are like that. Which just sounds like a patron model here. You have the patron of the business journal, you've got contributors. Um, it's just interesting to see different variations on how this gets paid. So I think um, two points that were done. I, I agree with Ross that um, there is some conflict there. And you went back to the 1%. That model actually works in social media and in technology. And the reason why it works, why you can support a business based on 1% to 5% of your base paying for the rest, of the, the rest of, the, of the public is because you have very low uh, uh, production costs and operating costs, and that's how every technology company works out there. So it's something to, to seriously look at from the news perspective. You were, uh, Corey, you were hitting on that, like how we, it is a lot cheaper to run uh, uh, a newspaper or a news organization online. So that, that's a business question, and, and, it's, and I, I think it's very valid, and it's been proven in many other uh, business uh, verticals out there. Um, so that could be one thing to, you know, like, um, like public radio that can be applied. The second one um, is to fracture the, um, the uh, operations of, of journalism. You, you guys talked about it. There's one thing is uh, investigative journalism. Another one is producing story. And there is this trend coming from, uh, when we saw it from Obama, Obama's campaign essentially became a news organization. They produce all the media. And in fact, 
Lance Bennett has done also some, um, some research that shows that people were going directly to the source. So what's the role of, of, of a newspaper when I can just go to, you know, Microsoft.com mic or, or Obama or, you know, the, the uh, right in Olympia, like Olympia.gov, and they will give me directly the news. You know, the, the governor will be uh, online all the time. We can see she will be Twittering, and so we will know what they're doing all the time. So we can go directly to the source. So what, you know, the fracture, fracturing journalism, and then we end up paying only for, for like, say, the, the, the investigative part, or we crowdsource that. I want to address the second point, what you said about how so many agencies are kind of becoming their own media and going around the filter of the media. And I think instead of, instead of saying, oh darn, we lost that filter, we should recognize that that was an easy filter. That was an easy filter to have. We used to be the only people who could tell you the traffic alerts. We used to be the only people who could tell you, you know, what things were open or closed or whatever, you know, information like that, that the Washington State Department of Transportation is telling on Twitter to almost 3,000 followers. You know, they don't have to go through newspapers and you know what, it's better that way because they can actually get the, the information to people faster, right? So, in other words, if we lose that filter, we've lost the ability to be the old, to have a monopoly over telling you easy bits of information that we just had to make a call to get. Heck, that was an easy filter. Let's create a new filter. Let's make a, let, let's work hard for a new filter and and convince people that they need to come to us for that information. So I'm about to be a wet blanket. Um, first, most people in America get their news from television which is short bites of non-contextual information because they don't have a lot of time in their life to devote to news, unlike those of us in this room. So I don't think we can expect most people to go out and look at six different websites to find their version of the story. They want a filter. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, we have a gap in media literacy. So not only do most people not have the time to do this, they probably don't have the skills to evaluate the different messages either, which again comes back to somewhere there needs to be filters. I think the difference is there's just going to be a lot more small filters. That doesn't get us to the point where how do we pay reporters? That's like another problem. I think that was a good definitive statement unless anybody wants to comment on that. So the point that was just made was about using technology that actually behaves that filter and using things like Google to automate news. But again, I think that would probably involve a certain amount of effort, which is what Kathy is explaining that most people aren't really interested in doing. We have three minutes left, so we're going to take one last question, right? And you've got the mic, so this is the last question. Um, I'd like to bring up an idea that, that came up in an event similar to this one that held, was, happened, was held in uh, Portland recently, um, which was that maybe there's a, a sort of complementary side business that could um, support journalism other than advertising. So newspapers with their printing presses, for example, have gone out and sold um, commercial printing jobs for people who didn't have their own presses. And that was kind of a way to leverage this asset that they had that they weren't using all day long um, to make some money. And, you know, it's not a ton of money, but maybe there are other sort of assets that even a digital news organization would have that could be leveraged in some other way to subsidize the news gathering. So multi-purposing infrastructure. I think that's Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think you might see stuff like that emerging. One thing I've been thinking about is with uh, Amazon.com and the Kindle. Well, you know, there was a news story that came out that uh, determined that it was uh, cheaper for um, the New York Times just to give out a Kindle to all their subscribers. But I, I started thinking, about it, it, was, it was kind of a joke, but there's actually potential power in that. If you gave out a, a Kindle, Amazon obviously wants to get the Kindle out in front of as many people as possible, but if you gave them the device and it was a specially branded device and when you booted that up, it, it was a local screen of news and it had some local ads and then you split that ad revenue back between Amazon and the news organization, I think there's some interesting stuff that could be done there. But I don't know, just one of a, I, I think there are a hundred or 
200 different models that you can play around with. But that's the fun thing about what's going on right now. All right, well, John, Ross, Corey, Monica, Corey, and David, thank you for hosting. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. I think it was really a good, good start. And I like the fact this was a true top-down affair. You guys were up top, we were down here. So again, we'll continue this conversation offline. That was great. Thank you. That was terrific.